Jess, I got a question for you. Oh yeah, sure. You've done some research into like marine adhesives, yeah? Oh yeah. So <laughs> what do these animals <laughs> use to stick themselves to the rock? Because there seems to be a pretty big lever arm on the, the small attachment point. Um, so the funny thing is actually, I'm not very good with any type of permanent chemical uh, adhesives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm more into reversible adhesion. So ask me about the chemistry of um, these holdfasts. I won't be able to tell you very well. Sorry to let you down, actually. I should uh, <laughs> take back my original comment. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't have a better answer for you there, Adam. Oh, that's all right. You should have been on my committee for... Uh, <laughs> Mm. Yeah, come full wide there. Please. Sounds like I'd be a pretty annoying committee member. <laughs> no, no, no. All are welcome. As soon as someone asks me about chemically binding adhesives, I will seize up like an engine. <laughs> but one thing that I found really fascinating for the last uh, leg that we were on was abundance of these sponges with these um, as Chris was explaining it to me these um, modified frustules that um, could ratchet into rocks and so it wasn't chemically adhering to rocks which is what I was kind of used to um, it was more having these grappling hooks and thousands upon thousands of grappling hooks that were um, like the glass spindles that were kind of reaching out into yeah the, yeah Almost yeah. like a Velcro of sorts. Okay. Uh, Almost like a Velcro, yeah. And so we spent a while diving into, I mean, what those, what the SEM of those look like, and you know, very fascinating structures. But that's a form of reversible adhesion, technically. So, just highly redundant. Bridge nav. One more step, 100 meters, 275. Thank you. Bathy pathies. There's another type of black coral there on the right. Or no, that was a sponge. What are you talking about? No, nah, it's fine. It's gone. Ah, it looked like a fuzzy, like, Christmas tree or pine. Mm, but it it was a, just a dead sponge. Does seem to be a lot, a lot of bamboo coral, and as mm -hmm. opposed to not a lot of black coral. Yeah. What is that? It's pretty slanted. Yeah. Do a partial there, Dave. It's a pretty massive hold fast, but you would think it would have to be because of the angle it's at just to hold up the fan. Yeah. These polyps look closed. I would say so. Got any tighter there, Dave? Yeah, they're all closed up. Mm. 
a word, please. Those ones, uh, the sponges, they look open on the top, some of these? Yeah, some of them do, yeah. A couple geologists in the back are wondering if they're <laughs> reg <laughs> regadrella. Regadrella. There's a polychaete polyche midwater, yeah. Yeah. All right, Dave, you want to challenge? And Want to center up? Yeah. Oh, what's that? Polyheat there? I think it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really swimming around. It's just kind of floating. <laughs> oh, or no, that's not a... What is that? that? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Oh, okay. What are you? It's a different looking one. Yeah. Oh, don't come into us. It's really not swimming. No, not really. Come Going up a little the bit flow. there on the delta there, Jake, please. Yep. Full wide, please. Might have to get a little yeah. bit ahead. Yeah, Raj. Well, Megan just asked if we could slurp that, but I think, Megan, we have to catch up to uh, that Argus might, here. might be a fool's errand, too, <laughs> trying to slurp that thing in the <laughs> That would be very fun, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you can, like, suction on and let's then just drive into it. Yeah. Let's find another one. Yeah, let's find a floaty. Megan, we're with you. Let's do it. I think Megan's question, can we slurp that? I think the answer is always yes. Yeah, just get quite a bit out in front, I think. This yeah, some terrain coming up there. Yeah. Lovely colonies. That one's pretty. Mm. That looks real healthy. Yeah, beauties. So you guys, I'm just going to go a little faster past these colonies just to get a little out ahead. Then we'll slow down. Okay. Sarah, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, someone's asking, do the slurped organisms survive once they're brought back on board, or does the change in pressure uh, negatively impact them? And since you work in the lab, uh, do most what happens to most organisms, or do you also try and keep some alive depending on what's you know who's needing them? The majority, um, well, I think the majority come up in good shape. I don't know if alive or not. All right, Dave, um, fish on in there. Oh, yeah. Anything with air in it, like um, fish or some of the sea cucumbers, do not survive the pressure change. 
Um, but the bamboo cor or the corals and the sponges do just fine with pressure changes. It's the temperature changes that often um, negatively impact them. Mm. Thanks. Was this what you wanted there, Adam, or did you want something else? Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. All right, full wide, please. These thickets, thickets of coral. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Whoa. I love these ones. Just blend in. <laughs> no one will know. I am a coral. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Is that? Orange color common for those? It's a very yellow base too. Yeah, that's. A I think it's uh, it's it's much more rare than do white. Do a partial one. there, please, Dave. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Thank you. Is this an ET sponge? This is an ET sponge. You can even see its filtering process. Jake, you want to turn off the lasers for a moment? Yeah. I'll get out in front again. Ooh, a Making star. a cameo. <laughs> 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 All right, full white, please. See if we can get out a bit. Come up a little bit there, Jake. I'll climb the wall with you. Absolutely. We're joined in the in the back row by Megan Putz, who's uh, much better than any of us at identifying all the organisms we're seeing. Well, Adam, we were doing all right. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, welcome, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Yeah, I think we did pretty well. I mean, and we're going to get better and better. But uh, the delta between me seeing something, looking it up. And then being totally past it is yeah. <laughs> often too much. <laughs> uh, Raj, taking a throwback the lasers on. Oh, yep. mute it first. Thank you. Jake, we have a question for you. Sure. Uh, someone's asking, does the Argus pilot have direct control of the tether winch to control the depth of Argus? Uh, I have direct uh, control of the 6-8 cable, not the uh, tether. So the tether is what connects Hercules and Argus together. Um, I have control over the 6-8 cable, which connects Argus to the ship. Um, so I can control the Argus depth. Um, and uh, I do that with this little box to my right. 
Um, it's the winch box. And I'm either paying out or hauling in cable as we move along the seafloor and traverse up and down the seamount. One thing to note is that the way we approach the seamount like this is to go uphill, uh, and that allows us to, you know, be safely arranged relative to the terrain and have a good view of it. Going downhill is is much harder because you want to be close enough to see the seafloor, but that means the back end of the ROV uh, can bump into the into the slope. This little white thing, the translucent thing, has that been, I've seen it a few times. Is that a holotherian or a sponge of some kind? I think it's a holotherian. Yeah? Yep, you're right. It is a cucumber. Megan, is holotherian a cucumber, but a cucumber is not necessarily a holothurian? Uh, sea cucumbers are on their day, the common name for mm -hmm. holothurians. And how do sea pigs fit into that? So a sea pig is a type of holothurian. Uh -huh. um, they're the usually in the family Eulipidae, mm -hmm. and they have those little modified feet mm -hmm. that walk along the bottom. So we might actually see some. Uh, we do see some sometimes around here, uh, but most uh, common ones are these ones of the Paleopodites, sort of very typical, lightly purple to darkly purple uh, sea cucumbers. Oh, and it's getting a little freaked out. It's going to swim away. So graceful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Well. I'll let yeah. them be. I'll rest here. Yeah, I'll let them take a break. Bridge now. One more step, 100 meters, 275. Thanks. Megan, I got a question about sea spiders. Okay, I'll try are, to answer it. Are they distributed throughout the oceans, or do they have regions that they're more common in? Um, we've seen them in, in pretty much all the oceans. Um, the one that we see most often here on seamounts are the giant sea spiders in the family Colocenidae. And uh, they're quite large and, and brightly orangish red. And they actually feed on anemones and corals. I think I might have seen one earlier. Yeah, they're pretty out. cool. You say they're cool, and I think they're, they creep me out. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, part of what makes them cool is how creepy they are. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Do a little partial in the sky while I pirouette around him. It's interesting how we have lots of common names that take a land thing and put it in the ocean. Sea cucumber, sea pig, sea spider. Mm -hmm. but we don't do this the reverse. No one calls a... Land jellyfish. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I read something recently, and someone can fact oh, check right. it, but sea urchins. Go ahead and come forward, please. Oh, now I can't remember which way it went. But oh, ur urchins on land might ur be. Porcupines. And there was, oh. an, there was an old reference. One of, one of the two, it was either called like land urchins or sea urchins were called, sea were porcupines. named after porcupines. But the porcupines were called something that was more similar to the word urchin. Hmm. You know. It wasn't echinoderm, was it? Land echinoderm? No. Land <laughs> echinoderm. Porcupine of many feet. There's another bathypathies in there. Still not a lot of black coral. Is that a mushroom coral? Yeah, I think so. Or Look. something else. I think you're are right. You, are, are, are you looking at the orange thing or yeah. the red thing? Yeah, the red thing and the... Yeah. There's a few of them. I haven't seen a lot of those yet. Go ahead and push on in there, Dave, please. Mm. Ooh. This one seems to be growing off of an old stalk. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Someone else's home. Huh. All right, full wide there, please, Dave. <laughs> hmm. 
So after this move, we'll start to go up slope, but it should be 260. Reg 260. Still got a, another 60 meters or so. Roger that. We did see a few of those um, on the last one. All right, everyone, it's been fun. Lisa's back. I'll try and get onto your watch tomorrow. Thanks, Kelly. Hey Dave, you wanna go ahead and push in on on the hold fast down here?
<laughs> That's great. Thanks, Dave. You want to come a little wide, please? There's some more barnacles, yeah? Yeah. Take a look at these guys. These are nice. It's good diversity here. Yeah. You want to do a partial there, please? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a precious coral there? That's my best guess. Sorry. Yeah, let's take a quick zoom. It does look like it might be uh, a hemichorallium. I'm basing that just basically that the base is white. Usually mm. with the paragorgias, the base tends to be a yellowy color. Go ahead and push but it a on good way place. to tell is to look at the polyps. The ends of the branches of the hemichorallium will have paired polyps, whereas in the bubble bubblegum coral, the paragorgia, um, it'll be more of a rounder ball at the ends of the branches. Yeah, so this looks like hemichorallium. Hemichorallium. And then in the branches of this coral, we have a snake star. Wait, that's one snake star? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I see Yeah, that. it's only one. So is a snake star in a brittle star family, or is it a different... Um, yeah, so the snake stars were related to the basket stars, and they're in the same um, order as the brittle stars. Hmm. Interesting. I tried to sample a basket star once, could not get it off oh, the right. end of the manipulator. Oh, yeah, like... I know. All the arms just sort of entangle yeah. up into everything. Does that star feed on the coral, coral itself, or is um no? Those ones don't actually feed on the corals, but it is thought that they do help the coral hosts that they're living on. Oh. With therapy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They tell them their problems. <laughs> Reach for the sky. <laughs> <laughs> they're therapy. They're just friends. <laughs> yeah, you know, you gotta have friends in the deep sea. It's like oh. climbing a tree, just hanging out. I'll regain some ground here, guys. Yeah. Yeah, there's been some research into the associate animals um, with corals, and, and if you can identify a coral based on the associates that it has. Um, mm. And... There's some, some truth to some of those associations. There are certain animals that are only ever found on a certain host, but in other cases, we're seeing, you know, some associates that just will find a host of any coral. Um, they don't seem to be particularly picky. So crinoids, for example, the feather stars, they, they seem to land on pretty much any coral and will we'll take advantage of it. But, um, for example, the snake star Opiacreus oedipus will only ever live on the Chrysogorgic coral Metallogorgia. And they're always together. Hmm. Every time we've seen one, they've always been together. And it, it seemed that the bamboo coral don't have as many associates. Is that true? Or are we just not uh, you can push looking that in there close bit, enough? Please, I think we're just not looking close enough. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of occasions where I've seen um, a lot of associates with these, especially these very large bamboo corals. Mm -hmm. That's like on the this. underside of this sponge. Is that a crab? Looks like a squat lobster, lobster or something. One of the two. Kind of hard to get. A I good keep look turning at my head as if I'm gonna look under. Kind <laughs> <laughs> of get a better view here, I guess. Yeah. Far into the That's probably now, a Unidopsis squat lobster. Unidopsis. Hanging upside down on top of this caliphagus. <laughs> Interesting. Can come a little wide there? Bridge now. Hmm. And one of our viewers that just joined the feed wanted to know 
what kind of rock this is, volcanic, they're assuming. Do we have a geologist on board? Yes, we do. Oh, yes, do we, we do. ever? Sitting to my right. Uh, Bridge, can we do 100 yeah, meters, so 260? The, this is definitely a basaltic uh, rock, but we're hardly seeing any of the basalt because it's coated with a thick layer of, of iron manganese crust. Uh, but we're picking up some of the rocks, and we'll break them open or cut them open, and and uh, the rock itself is basaltic, and and uh, some some of our scientists are interested in the rock, and some are interested in the crust. So there's lots of uh, lab work that'll be done on on the rocks that we collect. Megan, a question for you. One of our viewers wants to know why would a coral associate be species specific? Is there an advantage? Um, I'm not actually, actually sure uh, what the advantage would be to be species specific. Um, having only one species that you ever can live on could be li rather limiting. So say if you can't find your species preference, uh, it might be very difficult life for you because you're, you don't have that association. So uh, I'm not really sure exactly why you would ha only have animals that only live in one place, but that that could also be beneficial to both of the the animals if they only ever have one associate and they work together to keep uh, other animals away. Oh, check that out! There is a parasite on this fish. Oh, really? Yeah, you see that little white thing? I think that's an isopod on top of that fish's head. Wearing a hat. <laughs> yeah, it's the new fashion. <laughs> oh, the cowboy monkey rodeo. Or is that a regional thing? <laughs> <laughs> so this it's is very a very tail fish. <laughs> is um, that an isopod? Uh, it could be an isopod or an amphipod. I am mm. having a hard time telling. Oh, it's an, definitely an isopod. Mm. Oh, no, he doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no one's told yeah. him it's there. How embarrassing. Aww. Yeah. So that oh. little fish Ooh. is called Kumba, the type of rat tail fish. No. Yeah. And I think it got a little freaked out by Hercules. We often see fish having uh, isopod parasites on them. Uh, one of the more well-known ones is the isopod that will take over a fish's tongue, mm. basically eat the tongue and then become the fish's tongue. That's kind Copy of that. creepy. But oftentimes the parasites we see uh, are on the, the skin and uh, they basically just feed off the, the fish, but not so much as to damage it. Two six zero. So there we just saw a star on a uh, sponge. Yep. So usually uh, animals don't tend to like to eat sponges. Mm -hmm. uh, because, Gritty. Yeah, they're full of shards of glass, which isn't that delicious for <laughs> most animals. So we're seeing some more soft corals. These little ones look like pseudoanthomastis. Here's a question for probably both Megan 
And Adam, how do you decide what to sample? And why isn't there a lot of sampling happening on this leg of the dive? So for, for the rock side, we have targeted samples at different depths. So as we move along through the dive, we're collecting samples evenly between the, the base and the top of the seamount. And we're trying to be somewhat constrained on how much sample we collect so that we, you know, A, don't fill up all the, the available spaces for individual samples, and B, don't collect so much that Hercules is too heavy to come back to the, to the surface. So uh, we have a, a plan to collect kind of six to ten samples on each dive, and on a long dive like this, that means we want to spread them out a bit. Do you sometimes change your mind and toss one, get a new one? <laughs> Ooh, I've never <laughs> unsampled anything. You have to commit <laughs> the first time around, huh? Yeah. So yeah. only if it doesn't fit, I think, do we <laughs> unsample. Yeah. Definitely have seen doubling up, but never, never <laughs> taking out. For biology, um, we are focusing on finding new novel animals for science. Yep. So things that haven't been sampled before or sampled enough uh, in order to make a species description are important to us. Um, and then we also have some requests from students who are studying some deep sea animals. So we are on the lookout for some sea cucumbers at shallower depths. And we are on the lookout for some bamboo corals. And then we also have a wish list of items that uh, we've seen in the past uh, that were not able to be sampled at that time. So if we do see them again, uh, we're, we're going to try to collect those. Megan, one of our viewers would like to know more about your background and specialty. Um, so my background in, is in deep sea corals and sponges. Um, my day job is actually annotating this video uh, from ROV work. So I have done video annotations from uh, the Nautilus and also from the Okeanos Explorer, um, as well as from other platforms uh, like the Falcor's ROV as well. So what I mean by uh, annotating the video is I actually go back and I watch every single dive uh, in a cruise and we write down and record all of the animals that we're seeing, so mainly the corals and sponges that we focus on, and we were also focused on all the fish, and then all of the associated animals with these corals and sponges. Uh, and then we're recording things in the environment, like what the substrate is like here. So if, for example, this location, I would say it's uh, combination of some bedrock and cobbles and boulders that these animals are, are living on. And all of that data is then compiled in a database and uh, able to be used by scientists from around the world who would like to analyze the data. So um, that's what I do. And I, I work at the University of Hawaii doing these video annotations. Do you, uh, do you listen to the videos when you watch them or mostly just watch them? Um, sometimes I'll listen to them, especially if we see something interesting. Uh, Stolen a first octocoral, it looked like, on that sponge. <sighs> Sorry. A, yeah, it's a, yeah, no, it's, it's really fun to, to listen with the comments and everybody's comments during the dive. They can be quite funny and entertaining. Mm -hmm. Definitely uh, keeps my day uh, bright and happy. Yeah, sometimes. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> slowly morphing into Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, I was curious because I, I know that there's a lot of researchers and students that look through these videos and I, I didn't know how much of it was audio component or if you just kind of watch it and zone in and ID on your own. Yeah, so like um, we do stop and start the video a lot. So on occasion, especially in a very dense community, you can't really get a good sense of what people are saying because you're stopping every couple seconds. Uh, and in those cases, I usually listen to music just so that I can keep the pace of what I'm doing. But uh, I'll go back and listen to the audio, especially if I have a question about what everybody else was thinking mm. about an ID. And um, that can be really helpful because we have experts 
that are chiming in with IDs, uh, giving some fun facts. Uh, and I, I always learn something new every time I watch one of these videos. Hmm. It's sometimes interesting because like Steve has a different perspective when he's in the van because he does this as well. So he'll make like an audio note, like he'll make it a point to say something so that when someone's going through the video, they can uh, like know that that species was said out loud. Hmm. Exactly. We can, we can do that right now. Hi, Megan. Back <laughs> in your office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is really weird uh, to listen to your own voice mm. when you're annotating the video. Oof. That has been uh, something I've done in the past, and uh, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you ever talk to them in the video? Get closer, get closer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. When, when I'm watching from home, I'm just like, oh, why didn't they zoom on that? <laughs> And then when you're here and you're like so overwhelmed by so many beautiful things. So what's growing on the top of that dead sponge there? Or right. is that live sponge? Yeah, let's take a zoom on that. I think it is a Stoloniferous octocoral. Go ahead there, Dave. Bingo. Yeah. Yes. Um, Check. These are actually that notoriously hard to sample <laughs> because they tend to grow on rocks. Um, oh. So when they're growing on a sponge like this, uh, it makes it easy to sample. And that way we can have a record of these. Do you, are you suggesting that we collect a sample of this? I, I think we should collect a sample of this. Let's yeah, do it. Let's do it. Mm. Jake, we're going to do a flying grab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's do that. We do love it. those. Yeah, All right, do you want me to hold the ship up here? Yeah, please. They're super cute. Yeah? Yeah, please. Yeah, it's really hard to collect anything that encrusts a rock and then hard to preserve it um, because it's on a rock. So um, being on a sponge like this can be a really good way to sample this animal and uh, we have sampled something similar in the past but there's no it's real gonna have to way be to, quick to know exactly I'll if back it's up the same sure. thing oh mm -hmm. wait, please um so people studying this particular animal will pair those samples and be able to describe the species so science as we get uh, ready for the sample where do we want to stow it uh, so, uh, one of the forward bio boxes, either one is fine. Okay. Wait, uh, uh, do they have rocks in them? No. Okay, so if we could put it on top of a rock, that would prevent us from putting a rock on top of this. Well, why don't we put it in B, because we have the gastropod in there that we don't want to crush anyway, there, so rocks can't go in there. All right. Oh, yeah, that'd B. be good. This is light um, on a sponge, so it won't crush the gastropod. All right, I'll get you a bit closer. Do we know which part of it we want to go for? Um, just the, that tip. The left side? Yeah, Yeah, on the side. left side, that wider tip I think will be perfect. Right. I'm going to come down a little bit for you, Jake, sure. there. Come down. Nice. Like right here? Yep. Yeah, let's do it. That looks good. Give it our grab. Nice. Ooh. Nice. Very good. Show us what we got. You want to zoom in on that one there, Dave? Awesome. Ooh, careful. All right. All right, we're going to have to... Yeah, full wide, please. Jake, I'm going to buggy out in front. You want right. to just hold it there for a minute? Yeah, I'll just move it right here. We had a question about the green laser dots. They are 10 centimeters apart, and that allows everyone to measure and know what samples, what size we're looking at. And if we see um, a serianthid anemone, a tube anemone, growing on one of these sponges, we definitely want one of those, too. Because, again, like tube anemones can pull back down. They're usually nestled in between rocks. You can never grab them. They always get away. All right, so what's the consensus as to where we want to stow this bad boy? We're going to put it in forward bio box B. Which is on the starboard side. Starboard bio box E? 
Uh, nope. Forward, forward box, forward, starboard, box side. B. forward box, starboard side. Okay. Oh, right, we relabeled those. Okay, gotcha. There used to be Lambda and Omega. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, old habits die hard. All right, we should be good here. Do you want yeah. us to put it in with the limpet that we sampled from earlier? Right, yeah. Ship stopped up, so that should be all right. Roger. One of our viewers says it looks like it's holding up okay to present to someone. Oh. Can you pause just for a second? We're getting input on the chat about where to put it. Sure yeah. thing. Yep. File box B and forward. Forward by a box rack. All right, I'm full rack back. Tooling out now. Sarah, this was zero one five. Is that correct? Zero one five. Okay. Oh, I did. I did know back when we uh, collected it. The location. Nice. Make sure not the, that the jaws yep. don't fully open. Nice. Nice. Nicely done. Nicely done. Great job. And sorry, Megan, you also said there was another type of sample they wanted as well? Um, not here. I didn't see one. Um, but we want to look at those sponges as we pass them by if we see stuff growing on them. Because uh, there was one occasion where I saw a... Um, tube anemone growing out of a sponge oh. and those usually grow on the rocks and if we see one in something that we can actually sample that would be awesome because sure. they're very under described here in the deep sea and they're hard to collect so uh, the sponges are a really good opportunity i'm going to keep the uh, ship moving along then uh we're it's a lot easier to stop now that we're at 2,000 meters yeah roger that bridge nav If we could step 100 meters, bearing 260. Oh. <laughs> Megan, can you answer a question from an eight-year-old future marine biologist? Of course. Our future marine biologist is watching in their classroom and wants to know why are there no big fish in the deep ocean? Why is everything so small? That's a great question. Um, there are some bigger fish down here. We're just not seeing them. And uh, they could actually be actively avoiding the ROV. Um, fish are very mobile, so they can hear us coming and they, they will definitely avoid us. But some fish do seem to like to hang out with us sometimes. Uh, if you check out in the Argus view, you can sometimes see some fish following behind um, trying to use the lights uh, for foraging and uh, predating on animals. So it's not that they're not here. Uh, it's just that they're not being seen. And also, do some of the samples deteriorate when they are brought to the surface? Yes. So we have to work very quickly after we recover the vehicle in order to process the samples. Um, some of the corals will degrade quite quickly. Um, a lot of the tissues will, will break down. So we need to keep them cold and preserve them fast.
Oh, well, this uh, bamboo has a lot of associates down the lower right. I know someone was commenting that we hadn't been seeing a lot of associates. Oftentimes we see uh, sea stars that are actually feeding on the corals, and then you have other animals that are living in the branches. You'll see shrimps, you'll see brittle stars, maybe some feather stars. And turn down a little bit there, Jake. Yep. Hello, 12 to 4, uh, or 8 to 12, rather. I think oh. I'm on the wrong watch, but taking Adam's seat for a little bit. We right, knew you Steve's wanted to here. come back Steve. in here. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, my, Steve. My old watch, 8 to 12, <laughs> reassigned of poor, due to poor performance, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> we voted him off the watch. <laughs> yeah. you, drew the, you drew the short stick, right? No, yeah. yeah. Looks like it's picked up since 4 o'clock this morning. Oh yeah, Absolutely. how was it? How was it during your it was watch? Pretty sparse. Um, yeah. and we had some sparse branching bamboos as well as uh, just started to get into the bathypathies and primnoid corals a mm -hmm. bit, but nothing of this density. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of colophagus down there. Uh, we sampled some rocks, so it was a uh, much more loose, so it's pretty solid stuff. We collected two holothurians in the slurp samples. Did you collect anything else up in there? We collected rocks and water. Rocks and water. Yeah. You sound very excited yeah, we also about that. Very <laughs> <laughs> we also covered over a kilometer, so what did you guys do so far? Well, okay. We got like oh, point right. 0.8 in there, didn't we? Yeah, we got point 0.8 on our first all right, watch. All right, all and we right. had to set up for the dive. Thank you very much <laughs> there, Steve. <laughs> Let's see how much we've covered today. You want to do a partial in there, please, Dave? So far, we've covered 870, so... Yeah, well, I think we'll hit a kilometer. I think we'll hit a kilometer as well. <laughs> I think these can come into our world <laughs> and talk about what we do. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, nice to have you back, Steve. Nice to be back. I heard there was some chocolate. <laughs> That's really why I came. That's why you came up here. <laughs> no. <laughs> I see. Yeah, this is how are. your affiliation stems there, yeah? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and this is why you kicked off the watch. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Oh, wow. Great Argus shot there. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Just keep oh, yeah, an eye on that like sub-bottom as we go range. over it. Yep. Yeah, it's some predators in here. Uh, have we sure? established what the sea star predators are? A any observations close oh, up? Yeah, I don't think we've gotten some really good close ups of any of the predators. There was one on the back colony, kind of on the down current side. Uh, yeah, the red one. Yeah. On the, on the bottom right side? Yeah, on, on the right hand side. Keep, keep uh, going right. And on the back colony. There should right be a there. red spot. Yeah. Oops. Oh, that red spot there. Right, yeah, I got so the tower right straighter now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's a sea star. Looks like Take one. Look. Yeah, sea star. Oh, yep. Family of Goniastrid. Mm -hmm. Sea star and family Goniasterity. Ruthless. Ruthless. Coral predators. Go ahead and push on in a bit more there, Dave. Goniastrid. Just saying that so I remember it. Looks like Hibasteria. There's some of those hydrozoids, correct? 